My name's Ilya. Uh, the urge to email me. My email address is on there. Um, so the, agen the agenda, the things I'll be talking about. Oops. Um, some general information about fuzzing. Um, if you've got no clue about what fuzzing is, these two or three slides will give you an introduction. Um, then I'll um, run by some of the uh, most known and most used fuzzers. Um, I'll tell you what they do, um, some of the things they, they broke. Is it? Ah, oh, thank you. Is this better? Okay. Um, so I'll run by the most used fuzzers these days, um, tell you what they do. Um, some of the stuff they broke, uh, some additional information, and uh, for some of those, I'll, I'll have demonstrations. Um, that's the first part of my talk. The second part of my talk is basically about um, the things you need to build your own fuzzers or extend uh, currently um, existing fuzzers. Uh, and then there will be a conclusion. So, general fuzzing information. Um, fuzzing is basically um, you take uh, a chunk of semi-valid data or semi-random data and you feed it to an application. And with semi-random or semi-valid data, I mean that it's good enough so that the application thinks that it's data that it can parse. For example, if you've got a, a file which has a magic number and a magic number isn't there, the parser will say, oh, there's no magic number. It's not my file. I'm not going to parse it. Um, but if that magic number is there, it'll be like, oh, this is my file, and I'll parse it, and if you're lucky, it'll break on something. So that's basically what I mean with see my random or see my valid data. Um, the other thing which kind of amazes me with fuzzing is um, if you usually talk to people about fuzzing, um, the first thing that comes to mind is let's fuzz HTTP. Um, the, uh, um, so the thing is that HTTP has been fuzzed to death, basically. Um, but um, there's lots and lots of other things that you can fuzz. Basically, anything that takes any kind of input, any electronic device that takes input, can be fuzzed. Um, so some of the things that you can fuzz are network protocols, network stacks, anything that uh, uh, SUI takes, you know, arguments, standard input, environment variables, file descriptors, signals, all sorts of uh, cool stuff. Um, you can fuzz APIs, um, system calls, and I'll be talking about that later. And you can also fuzz uh, library calls. Um, and you can also fuzz files, and I'll also talk about that later on. Um, the thing about fuzz is that they're amazingly cool. Um, it's kind of hard to describe um, fuzzers. You really have to like um, try some of those and see how cool it is to break stuff with doing very little. Uh, right, so this is kind of a um, uh, quick thing I made which shows you some of the things that you can use to fuzz in a suit binary. So, you know, most people think of arguments and some think of environment variables, and that's about where it ends. You've got a lot of other things that you can use to fuzz. Um, you know, you've got signals, uh, file descriptors, um, you know, current working directory, uh, shared memory, TTY, um, timers, uh, all, all sorts of stuff. Right, so, um, the kind of fuzzers that um, people use. Um, first of all, you've got manual testing, which isn't really fuzzing. It's kind of usually preparing to fuzz. Um, what you do is you observe the, net, the, the data being exchanged between client and server, for example, or what a file format looks like, change a few things, run it through whatever it has to parse it, and see if it will parse it or not. Um, and you'll try to look for interesting stuff, you know, size fields, uh, things that might look like strings, uh, and, you know, a few other things. Um, then you try to change that data and see what happens. Um, this is usually preparation for fuzzing. But it's not uncommon that while you're doing this, you will, you'll, already find, you'll already find one or two bugs. Um, the second kind of fuzzing is semi-automatic fuzzing, which is basically where you've done manual testing, and you'll have a script which does these things, and you'll do one test run of your script, and then examine what's happened. And this is interesting because um, you can use semi-automatic fuzzing um, to notice very subtle bugs, things that you would normally not find or not notice with automated fuzzing. Um, uh, information leaks are a great example of that. Um, they're usually, uh, you usually can't find it with automated fuzzing, but with semi-automatic fuzzing, um, those are one of some of the things that you should look at. Um, and then what most of my talk will be about is automatic fuzzing. And this is basically where you have a script or a program which iterates over a very, very big loop. And this can be an endless loop, and just tries to spit out all sorts of semi-valid or semi-random data. And you just wait till something crashes or it hangs or you know, it reboots or whatever. 
Um, right, so more specifically, the tools that you'll want to use for fuzzing. Um, fuzz, they're made by people, obviously. Um, the first one is fuzzing tools. They'll, they'll fuzz one particular protocol or one particular file or maybe something that very narrowly fuzzes one particular system call, something like that. The other one are fuzzing frameworks, and those are more interesting because um, they're written usually in some kind of scripting languages, and they don't fuzz on themselves, but they give you very, very useful APIs um, to fuzz stuff. Um, they'll do MD5 checksums and CRC32, and they can do compression and URL encoding and decoding, and all of these cool things that you no longer have to implement. So that means you get to write your fuzzers or your fuzzing scripts a lot faster than you would if you would write your own tool. Um, most of these fuzzing um, frameworks these days, they come with default scripts, and lots of those scripts are usually very cool. I mean, if, if it worked against one product and it's never been tested get against another product, if you run against the other product, chances are you'll find a couple of bugs. Um, some of those, most of the frameworks are um, specifically focused towards um, network uh, fuzzing, um, but there's, uh, there's one, at least, uh, Peach, which I'll be talking about later, um, which does more than just network fuzzing. Um, it can do file fuzzing and API fuzzing and all the things I just summed up uh, a slide ago. And the, the thing about these fuzzing frameworks is that, um, well, I mean, they've got a learning curve because you need to know the API and if it's a language you don't know, you'll want to learn at least the basics of that language. Um, so there's a learning curve. So um, having said that, let's move on to some of the cool tools that you can use to fuzz things. Um, the first one is Protoss. Um, this one's developed at the University of Ulu. Um, it was initially developed in 99 until 2001, and some other people, 2002, 2003, picked it up again. And then somewhere this year, somebody picked it up again, and, and um, they developed a, uh, an IPsec fuzzer, well, I, um, I, uh, some of the IPsec stuff. And pretty much lots of people were vulnerable again. So um, this is sort of, I guess, actively ongoing. And they developed just one tool, and then which will um, very precisely uh, fuzz the protocol to in, in great, very uh, deep detail. Um, one of their most known fuzzers are the uh, SIP fuzzers and SNMP. Um, unfortunately, the thing's written in Java. I'm not a big fan of Java, so. Um, but it's still really cool. Um, you should definitely check out their website. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, so. I don't know if you could all read this, but if, if you read slides later, you can look over it. Um, these are just uh, this is scratching the surface. This is just some of the stuff that Protoss broke. It's, basically, it's broken like a, a thousand different things. Um, one of the things which, um, my, which uh, why people might remember Protoss is because I think in 2001 or 2002, they exposed what I call the big SNMP fuck up, where basically everybody who implemented SNMP based their code on some old SNMP code, and they were all vulnerable to the same bug, so that was kind of bad, and that's one of the things that Protoss found. Um, the guys who initially developed Protoss started a company called Codenomicon, and they've got a whole range of fuzzers, or um, yeah, test suits, which is what they call it, and they're used for um, commercial companies. It's basically sort of the same approach as Protoss, at least from what I've heard, where um, they go um, in very deep detail for every protocol and have a large set of test cases that they can run. Um, I've been told that those products are not really cheap, so if you're not a big company, uh, you, can, you probably cannot afford those tools. Um, right, so even more Proto stuff. Even today, you can use Protoss against um, some, of SI, some SIP stuff, for example, and find some really neat stuff. Um, so one of the things that a friend of mine has looked at is uh, a hammer call analyzer, which is a, a sniffer specifically designed for SIP uh, interpretation. And he found a neat bug in there where you can write a zero byte anywhere. Um, the guy who found it is called Kokanin, which is his nickname. Uh, for those of you who you might know him on something else, he's, he's a hacker that got pH neutralized. Um, so this is um, the uh, hammer call analyzer. And you know, if you just run protos against it, you get this. And you know, this is the old famous pop-up in Windows saying, you know, your program crashed, and do you want to report this to us or not? Um, I actually don't understand all of that, because um, this was done on a German box, and I'm pretty bad at German, but you know, everybody should be able to recognize the, um, the pop-up um, 
window you get if stuff crashes. Right, and if you look at it with a debugger, um, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, underneath there it says access violation when writing to an address. And basically you control that address. And if you look, yeah, I don't, you probably can't see it above, but it's basically it's a move instruction where you write a zero byte to anywhere you want to. So this is one of, so this is a bug that got found with Protoss. Um, and here's my zero day giveaway for today. Um, this is the, the um, proof of concept that Kokanin made um, to trigger this bug. And it's basically, it's a very small Perl script, and this will exactly tell you where the bug is, and if you want to write a cool exploit for it, this is a really good starting point. Right, so moving on to the next um, fuzzing uh, fuzzer. This is Smudge. Um, it's a uh, fuzzing framework, which is written in Pyth uh, Python um, by a friend of mine, Andy. Uh, yeah, so much stands for Software Mutilation Ut uh, Utility and Data uh, Generation Engine. Uh, it has support for a lot and a lot of protocols. Um, unfortunately, it only does network fuzzing, um, so you can't do anything else with it. Um, some of the test cases it uses um, were taken from Spike, which is something I'll cover in the next couple of slides. Um, so yeah, uh, Smudge is pretty cool. Unfortunately, it's unmaintained. Um, so it's kind of hard to, because it's got some bugs in there, so it's kind of, if you don't know it that well, it's kind of hard to work with it. But it's pretty cool though, you can find some lots of, stuff, uh, lots of cool stuff with it. For example, it broke subversion, shoutcast, some IRC demons, um, uh, a bug in mod security, and a whole range of other stuff. Right, so this is um, the subversion bug, which is um, basically you get control over several re registers. And then um, the one where, um, breaks now is um, basically a read from an address you can control. In the bottom you can see 3F, 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 which is an address you control. And later on down at CodePad, um, you can actually write to some of the addresses you control. So this one's a pretty neat bug. Right, so that was Smudge. Um, mm, yeah, okay, moving on to Spike, um, which is a fuzzing framework, which is written in C. Um, it's written by Dave Itell. Uh, it comes with um, a lot of the full fuzzing tools for anything you can imagine, you know, the Oracle TNS listener, um, it's got support for lots of, uh, like, remote RDP for, um, for Windows, um, a Gopher daemon, um, and a whole range of other cool things. Um, Spike is a huge, huge tool. It's really cool. Um, it's what Dave I talk called, it uses block-based fuzzing, which means that um, if you've got a protocol, you can split it up in several, in several blocks and then start, um, it's start um, fuzzing from uh, a specific block. Um, most people um, uh, say that um, Spike doesn't have that many documentation. Um, I think it actually has a fair amount of documentation. It's got some slides that Dave has, um, a paper, and a whole lot of um, f uh, fuzzing tools and fuzzing scripts in there uh, that you can just look at and see what it does and just learn from it. Um, unfortunately, uh, Spike, again, only does network fuzzing. Um, yeah, it kind of sucks, but, well. Um, and then there's Spike file, which is um, sort of like Spike. Basically, it's um, Spike 2.9, and um, it's a modification which Adam Green from iDefense made. And basically, all the network stuff got ripped out and got replaced um, with um, code to fuzz files. Which is interesting, because you get the same scripting language that Spike has, but now you cannot only fuzz networks, but you can also fuzz files. Um, so, some stuff that Spike broke. Uh, it broke a lot of stuff, uh, you know, the lists here. Um, the, the interesting thing about um, Spike is that, um, like, some of the scripts are kind of broken. Like, Dave I tell, at least I'm guessing, um, probably broke them a little bit so that zero day he found doesn't get um, exposed. Um, and on his mailing list, uh, there's um, a guy, Andy, who, um, who made a comment about it, saying he recommends to use Spike, um, you know, although it's written in C, and it appears to be broken on purpose, you know, it's really cool to, um, to, to use and find cool bugs with it. So, um, uh, right. I was actually going to do a demo of Spike uh, with the golf for fuzzing and show you that um, if you make some slight modifications, you find cool bugs in Internet Explorer. Um, but unfortunately, because um, it's DNA Explorer for Mac OS, unfortunately I don't have a Mac with me, so I couldn't do it. Um, but uh, the code can be found on my website, and if you have a Mac and you try it against your Mac, uh, 
IE or Mac, um, you'll find a heap overflow in there. Um, so, how to start with Spike? Um, basically, um, Spike has a sort of a scripting language, and um, the way you usually start um, with, uh, if you've got an unknown protocol, is you sniff it, and then just take the binary dump you get from Ethereal and use the S binary. And then you start looking through the binary code and see if you can recognize some integers or string fields or whatever. And you replace them with calls like S word and X, XDR uh, string. And it's got like a whole range of other functions as well. Um, and then, you know, you find the, the lengths and you mark the blocks beginning and end. And then, uh, you know, try to see if it still works because if it doesn't, you kind of fucked up somewhere. Um, right. That's basically uh, how you do it. You can just, uh, it's got, you can just call a loop there and then start fuzzing and just let it run until something breaks. Um, this is basically a slide I took from um, Dave Vitale's presentation at Black Hat a couple of years ago because this is, is the essential stuff you need to start with Spike. Um, right. This is another um, thing. Um, a guy called Tom Ferris um, made a small uh, Spike script for RDP, which is the uh, remote desktop protocol for Windows, and you know, he ran against Windows and uh, got a cool bug out of it. And the, uh, the very interesting part is that um, Windows XP Service Pack 2 comes with a uh, firewall which is on by default and it's got everything, all incoming stuff filtered with the exception of RDP. So that's kind of, um, you know, even though the firewall's on, it's filtering almost everything, you can still um, do a denial of service against the Windows, um, against the Windows box with this. Right. Um, yeah, the other thing is Spike by default does not work on macOS. Um, I wanted to get it to work on my macOS and came to the conclusion that um, most of the code, uh, pretty much all of the code, works on macOS because um, it was initially written for Linux and so far it only compiles on Linux. And the only thing that you have to do if you want to get it to work on macOS is change some of the arguments to linker and then um, change the LD library path to uh, DY, LD library path, and coming out LD, um, RP, LDL RPC. And then Spike just compiles on macOS, and you can do whatever you want to do with Spike on macOS, and you're not just restricted to using Linux. Um, right, so that was Spike. Um, the uh, next fuzzing framework is Peach. Um, it's written in Python. It's written by a guy called Michael Eddington. He developed it during Peach Tutorial, I think, last year or the year before. Um, most people are very lyric about it and say that the documentation is so wonderful. I don't really agree there. I mean, there's a lot of documentation, but it's all auto-generated from comments inside the code. And the thing with uh, comments in, inside code for documentation is that if you're not very well aware that it's comment for documentation and you don't put a lot of effort and thought into it, it's more um, comments that document your code and aren't, that ex aren't exceptionally useful if you don't have the code sitting right next to your comments. Um, so that's why I'm not a, I don't really like the documentation in Peach. Um, the other thing that annoys me a little bit about Peach is that um, it's got a, a whole range of APIs to generate a lot of cool things. Um, but like a lot of the APIs are there to generate valid data. You know, it can do URL encoding, it can do encryption, compression, um, checksumming, all sorts of these things. But it does all valid stuff, you know. And because it's a fuzzer, you want to create invalid data. So, I mean, it's got, Obviously, it's got some uh, APIs in there to create invalid data, you know, the, 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 the normal stuff, you know, strings and integers and stuff. But the cooler things, you know, like compression and URL uh, encoding and stuff like that, there are no hooks to um, create malformed data. So that's kind of the thing I miss in Peach. Um, besides that, it's a wonderful frame, um, fuzzing framework. Um, you know, um, the difference between Peach and the other ones I covered is that Peach uh, does a lot more than just network fuzzing. It can fuzz APIs, it can fuzz files, it can fuzz com objects, it can fuzz pretty much anything. Um, recently, uh, Michael Eddington released uh, peach.net and peach.c, which you can use to fuzz .net stuff and fuzz anything written in all APIs from C. Um, right, I don't have a slide of stuff I broke because apparently people aren't keen on telling uh, the world what some of the things they found with Peach. Um, it's a cool framework though. Um, you should definitely check it out. Right, this is the uh, documentation from Peach. Um, but yeah, so it's all auto-generated. I'm not a big fan of this documentation, so um, maybe some people are, but I don't like it that much. Right, 
This is a, one of the sample scripts in Peach. Basically, this is a sample script to show you how you can do um, com object fuzzing. So, yeah, if you read documentation, all of this makes sense. Uh, yeah, or, you know, if you read documentation and toy with it a bit, it makes sense. Right. The next um, fuzzing um, framework that I want to cover is the, um, the protocol independent fuzzer, um, which is written by a guy called Matthew Franz. It's not a fuzzing framework, unfortunately, and this really sucks. Is um, It's not available to the public. I've never used it either, but um, Matthew Franz um, in 2004 made a um, presentation for Black Hat um, talking about um, doing some uh, examining the um, security of uh, BGP and how it's implemented in several routers. And throughout the slides, you'll see a lot of cool things that he does with his fuzzer. And he'll go into some detail of how the fuzzer works, but it's not never never been released. And so I emailed, I emailed him about it. Said, you know, you know, is it ever going to be released? And he said, you know, he would have loved to, but you know, Cisco management didn't like it. So unless you work for Cisco, you're not going to see this tool ever, unfortunately. Um, from the slides, um, it says that it found four or five BGP-specific implementation bugs. So that's pretty neat. Mm. Yeah. So the next one is um, the Mangle Me fuzzer. Uh, right. This is uh, written by uh, Mikhail Zalewski. And uh, this was done somewhere last year. And probably everybody knows it because it got slashed out. Uh, basically, what it does is it generates um, something that looks like HTML, but is very, very broken. Um, the code itself is pretty clean. Um, the Mangle Me code, it's easy to extend it. Um, he's got a demonstration of uh, Mangle Me code on his website, which is mangle2.cgi. Actually, you're supposed to go to mangle.cgi, which doesn't do anything, but it gives you a big honking warning saying, if you proceed, Things, will, things might go very wrong, files will get, might get deleted, your box might crash, and whatnot. Um, and then Mangle 2 is the actual tool which gives you a demonstration, which just start fuzzing your browser. And, you know, if, if you're unlucky, or if you're lucky, I don't know, you know, your browser will break. Um, so the things that Mangle me broke were like, um, pretty much all browsers that ever exist broke on it. Uh, yeah. And then um, Andy, um, made a port to Python. And he changed a few things, and he made it a little bit smarter than, um, than MangleMe was. And so a few minor modifications, and he fuzzed the now very famous iframe bug in IE and then led to some worm. Um, the thing with these tools is that um, they're just scratching the surface. Um, there's so much more that you can do with browser fuzzing. And also just the HTML part, um, what Mikhail Zaluski did is, he took the most common tags and most, most common attributes and started fuzzing those. Um, I made a modified version where I just took the HTML4 specification and I put all the tags in there and all the attributes. And if you run it again, you get some new bugs in IE, some new bugs in Firefox, and pretty much all browsers out there. Um, you can find that um, tool, which is, which is basically an extension of HTML, um, on my website. There's a link to it at the end of the slides. And I'll give a slight demonstration of some of the things I've generated, and you'll see Firefox die in a couple of minutes. Right, but first, um, so some more stuff about HTML. -er. Um, this is, um, so Andy fussed the thing, and uh, he posted it to, I think, full disclosure. And then um, Skyline uh, examined it and said, you know, basically you, you get to smash uh, an instruction pointer. <laughs> okay, so that's code execution, obviously. Um, right, so, right. Let's see, this is, um, Firefox, and because, um, yeah, generate these before, because if you generate them, sometimes it takes a while to hit something that breaks, but this is what the new, so this is, you can, uh, so this is, you can see this 107, which is not the latest one anymore, but it was a couple of weeks ago, because I think 1.5 is released these days, so, but this one's a pretty recent one, so all the bugs that were found with Mangle Me Fuzzer, they were fixed. Um, so this is the, the extension I made to HTMLer, and I think this one should. Give it a second. Yep. And voila, there. And it basically crashed, and you can send stuff to Mozilla. I think this one's a no-point reference, but there's not a one in there where um, you get to smash um, a function pointer. Um, yeah, some basic details in there. You know, 
basically the stuff you need to see what, what's going on. Um, so, uh, you know, if you make some small modifications to, um, to HTML, you can still find new bugs that, uh, oh, fuck, I'm not network connected, so. <laughs> you know, you don't want to give people your bugs before you got a cool exploit, you know. Um, so, um, the next tool is Mangle, um, which is a very, very small piece of code that I made, um, yeah, about a year ago. And it's, it's only 60 lines of C code. And what it does is it takes a file and you, say, you, you give it a header size, like let's say it's a page long. And what it'll do is it'll, um, it'll, see, it'll take 10% of the header size and then use that in a loop and then randomly choose an offset inside header and just change, ch change, randomly change a byte and have that byte bias towards the highest bit set because you, know, you want to try and trigger some sinus bugs, things like that. Um, this is basically, you know, the, the, the kind of Unix way that I did it, you know, to keep it simple, because in order to effectively do things, you, you, you'll have to use a bash script to have a loop and stuff like that. Um, right, and these are some of the things that I found with it. And I'll give you a demonstration of the PHP, of some PHP box. Um, basically, because my original Mangle tool is not the one I'm gonna use, but I made a port to Python, where it generates uh, HTML as well, and then just, uh, points the HTML to an image file, which I used Mangle on. And, mm, what? What? Should be one of these. Nope. Right, so this is, um, this is the test of PHP is basically, you know, it's going through all the stuff I've, um, I've made with, um, with the Mangle tool. And then if you, uh, so this is the little script there. If you can read PHP, or even if you can't read PHP, it's fairly trivial code. So basically it goes over a, a range of files and sees if, if they're JPEG files with exif data in it, it'll, excuse me, um, it'll try to parse them. And if you run it now, just wait a second. Well, right there, possible to teach overflow and the process stop. So, um, and the exif code in PHP isn't that wonderful. You've got a couple of other very nasty stuff in there. Um, right. So that's, uh, but it really the Mangle tool really kind of surprised, took me by surprise because it's the most trivial thing you can ever imagine and like everything breaks on it. Um, right, so this is some of the, um, some of the things I fussed with it and some of the images you get and you know, some kernel oopses and seg faults, stuff like that. Right, the, uh, another one I made is a very, very small system call fuzzer. Um, system calls are basically, if, if you don't know what system calls are, they're, they're basically a service that your kernel provides to you and you can just tell your kernel I wanna do that service and give it some arguments and if, if, if your arguments are valid and you're allowed to do that system call, the kernel will do that for you. Oops, damn. Um, so um, what I've done basically is um, I've generated random system calls and then given it random arguments, you know, like um, pointers that point to kernel space or invalid pointers, you know, null pointers or um, a pointer to some data where I put, to some, play, some piece of memory where I put random data, you know, stuff from defq random. Um, and I just f fed it to um, the kernel. And obviously, um, there are some system calls that um, you want to ignore because they interfere with fuzzing. Uh, you know, exit's obviously one. You know, you don't want your fuzzer to stop. You want it to continue until you get a kernel panic. Um, some others are fork because it's very annoying when you've got a fork bomb while you're fuzzing. <laughs> um, and there are a couple, a couple more. You know, you got some some things in there that sleep indefinitely, things like that. So you, you want to have a, a list of things that you don't want to fuzz. And besides that, everything else is fine. Um, so usually this results in a kernel panic or an, on Linux an oops message. And um, I think, yeah. So it broke Sky Unix where, you know, and I'll give you a demo of this in about two minutes. Uh, it breaks, you know, easily. And the, the panic's kind of neat though. And then Mac OS obviously broke because Mac OS breaks and everything. Um, right, so this is, and I'll show you this in real time, but um, I'll do that first because that's cooler. Right, so this is, uh, this is called Unixware. 
you know. And this is my system call fuzzer. Just let it run and run, and bam, that's a kernel panic. You know, the, the, the kind of, the pink kind of thing there, that's a kernel panic. You know, my mouse is no longer moving, it's dead. So, okay. I'm done with this, because I'm gonna close VMware, because it's a huge strain on resources. Okay, so. Um, so this is you know, what you guys just saw. You know, you get a normal Unix and you're working on it and you're doing stuff and bam, it goes down. Oops, something went wrong. And here's a, a, another cool thing. When I rebooted the, uh, the VMware, you know, it gave me a core dump of the, core, of the kernel. You know, do you want to save this core dump? And like, of course I want to save it. Do you want to compress it? No, because I have enough disk space. Do you want to encrypt it? Yes, because I don't want other evil hackers to see the things I've done. And then you go like, okay, so enter your encryption key, and obviously there's an evil hacker standing behind me, so I don't want him to see my key. Um, but then, you know, my key's there in plain text. <laughs> you know, so it kind of makes no sense to give an encryption key and then just put it on your screen like, hi, I'm an encryption key. <laughs> right, um, so another really cool thing, uh, a, a very small fuzzer is um, what the guys from Etrial developed, because I don't know if you guys have looked at uh, Etrial over the years, but you know, they spit out a lot of advisories. With, you know, get, the advisories kept growing exponentially. You know, in 2001, it was like one or two issues, and the beginning of this year, there were like 50 issues in one advisory. Um, so one of the, what, what the guys at Etrial did is they said, well, you know, we don't want to have this kind of bad record. So they made their own little fuzzing tool, and they used Edit, edit Cup, which is a tool they've made, and they made a small shell script around it, which does some statistics and tells you some, some things that Edit Cup wouldn't. And it's written by the guy who made uh, Ethereum, uh, Shadow of Gorms. And today, um, I think they've, they fuzz more than 600 bugs in Ethereum. That's kind of impressive. Um, you know, the, the usual stuff, overflows, endless loops, no point references, division by zero, and a lot of other things. Um, and what, what's interesting is, and I don't think anybody's ever done that before, or at least not, talked about it, um, is that um, basically what this tool does, it takes a PCAP file, which is a uh, almost raw file of network data coming through with, with some metadata in it. And it takes a PCAP file and it, ser it just searches for stuff and changes bytes, you know, puts format string bugs in there and, you know, FFFFF and things like that. And then just feeds it to Ethereal, this PCAP file, because Ethereal compares PCAP files. And if Ethereal breaks, they just fuzz the bug with this thing. So you don't even need network connectivity, you just need a, a good PCAP file and bam. And the cool thing is um, TCP dump can also parse PCAP files. So you can just take this fuzzer and the only thing you'd have to change is the name of the program you want to call, which is instead of Tetherreal, it's now TCP dump, and just let it parse that file. And I'm guessing that if you would do it on TCP dump, uh, you'd easily get lots of lots of bugs. Because TCP dump is not written with security in mind. Uh, right, so, and this is one of their advisories thing Mark, no, uh, May or June or something. And this is some of the stuff they found um, with, uh, with their fuzz tool, you know, they're, uh, freeing uh, uninitialized variables and infinite loops and, you know, trivial stack smashes, all sorts of very nasty stuff. Um, Another fuzzing framework, which is called BED. Um, I've forgotten what it stands for now. But it's a, a fuzzing framework which is written in Perl. Um, it's got some cool scripts, um, and it has a very, very simple way to make scripts for it. Basically, the scripts you write for BED are also written in Perl. And it's got some, well, I'll show you in the next slide, some really cool, uh, easy things in there, which makes sense. So, uh, right, um, so next slide after that, that is. Um, some of the things that broke, um, basically some, you know, some web servers and FTP servers on Windows. Um, nothing that big, um, but it's, it's, it's a nice framework. It's a smaller one, so it doesn't have lots of APIs or lots of cool scripts, but it's, 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 it's an interesting one. Right, so this is a simple, this is a, what plugins for bed look like, where you've got, um, you know, initialize, how to quit, do pre-out stuff, do stuff after authentication, how to do authentication, these kinds of things. So it, BET's only made for network um, fuzzing either. 
but I like the way they've organized things. Right, so um, here's a, another small thing I've made, which is called um, IRC fuzz. And basically what IRC fuzz is, is it's a very small fake IRC daemon. And when somebody connects, it'll just um, spit out something that looks like IRC, but it's really not, and it's just used, it's just designed to try to break your um, IRC client. Um, and basically, with the exception of IRC, all of the clients I tried broke. Nothing survived. Um, and, right, oh, I'm not going to show this one yet because I'm going to demonstrate it first. Um, I have it here. Right, so this is, I've got the IRC fuzzer already running. I'm going to do it in full screen. I've got it running, and I've got it in a debugger attached, or I'm going to run it through a debugger, so that you can see things that go wrong. And it, you run it, and it connects to it. Bam, it dies. And you run it again, it dies again. You know, so it's got like lots and lots, you know, four or five bugs that easily pop up. Just, you know, we've got three different bugs right now, and I think, I think my bug count right now is like 15 or 16. Um, so lots of lots of things in there. Um, obviously, this shows that IRC2 was written in another um, another area, another period of time, and it's not up to standards these days anymore. Um, you know, the guys who wrote it didn't have a clue what security was and what the fuck is bound checking, you know. Um, so um, and what's kind of um, which I'll show in one of my slides. Um, so the next slide is, um, so this is basically one of the stack smashes you saw there. You know, and one of the stack smashes is kind of cool because it's, it's, um, it's just a message that you're sending. So it's bigger than 512, so you would assume that servers don't uh, allow it through, which is true, which, which they don't. But because it's just a simple message, you can do a DCC chat, and when people accept it, you can just, you know, basically, you know, if you want to own them with that, you can just do it client side. You don't need to have an evil server for that. Um, so this is one of the stack smashes you saw, and um, I've got a friend of mine whose nickname is JDoc, and he's got an IRC client which is based upon IRC too. It's called Ninja. So I send him my, my fuzzer and I say, you know, try it and see what happens. And you know, um, because his client was based on IRC too, most of the bugs in IRC too showed up in his client as well. So he fixed them and he sent an email to the um, the guy who's responsible for maintaining IRC too, and he got an email back from the guy saying, oh yes, I know about that bug. We're just not going to fix it. So I don't know, I don't really remember the reason why, but I think it's kind of odd that if you've got this amount of things, which you can easily fix, I mean, you've just seen it, you know, just bug after bug after bug, you know, just right then and there. Um, so this is pretty bad, and I don't know why the guy fix, uh, hasn't fixed it or doesn't want to fix it, um, but he should. Um, so right, so that's RC Fuzz. Um, it's kind of, yeah, funny thing. Next one's Isaac. Um, this one's a bit older, I think, in the 90s, 90, maybe 98 or something. And it's basically an IP stack integrity checker. Um, it's not called a fuzzing tool, because back then people weren't calling things fuzzing tools. Um, but it is a fuzzing tool. Um, it's written in C. Um, uh, it's written by a guy called Mike, Mike Franza. Basically, it, gen it generates um, IP, TCP, UDP, and I think even ICMP data, which is flawed. It looks like it, but it's really not that kind of data. Um, and then, you know, it's got some cool stuff in there, you know, it may, may break shit, melt your network, knock out your firewall, or sing the fur of your cat. Um, so it's, it's a pretty cool thing, and if you, see, it's, if you see the next slide, it's broken a lot of very high-profile stuff. You know, you don't want your firewall all of a sudden quitting, you know, that's kind of bad. Um, and a few other things, and probably if you, if you run it against some, um, some other things these days, you'll probably find cool things. Right, so that's ISIC. Right. The next one's Combust. Um, this is written um, by uh, a guy at stake, um, Brett Winnett. I guess it's Symantec now. Um, he did a talk about this at Black Hat, and he showed uh, how to use it, and um, I've kind of uh, played with it for, um, for one day. And you know, I installed my X XP service pack to a fresh install. You know, I did a complete up upgrade, and this was like back in June or something. Um, so, and you're playing with it one night, I came up with about 15 bugs. So, and that, some of those things can be triggered through Internet Explorer, which I'll show in the next. Uh, well, show some of the screenshots on the next page. Um, so you find a shocking amount of stuff in um, you know 
things that people are running today, which is, you know, with the latest security patches and things like that. Um, one of the things that um, it doesn't do is it doesn't enumerate over all the com objects you have in Windows. So um, you just go to Microsoft.com, you look for this tool called Oily View, and uh, so this one, and download it, and this will give you an overview of all the registered com objects on your Windows box. And um, you've got to find com objects that are, have um, the I dispatch method, because otherwise you can't fuss them with combust. Um, but you find a lot of stuff with it, and so this is the first thing. And basically, the what you see above here is the OLA view tool from Microsoft. And what you see here is um, well, what you see here is Combust. And basically, what you do is you say you say give me the class ID of that com object, and it'll just um, see all the methods that it, that it exports and that you can use, um, and it'll try to fuzz all of them. And Combust has a fairly big configuration file. So um, a lot of the things in Combust can be modified, like um, if you want to overflow with not A's or, or B's, and you don't want strings to be 5,000 lines of code, uh, 5,000 um, chapters long, but 7,000, then that's OK. Um, however, if you make the lines um, that you want to fuzz with bigger than 15,000 lines of A's or B's or whatever, Combust will crash. <laughs> um, So yeah, I guess there's, there's a bug in Combust as well. Um, uh, so yeah, um, yeah. Um, and then I've got another screenshot with some other stuff. So basically what it does is it tries to fuzz all the, you know, in, the, in teachers and long strings and things like that into all the methods that a common object has that it can get its hands on. And then whenever any kind of exception occurs, it'll just catch it and say crash. And if you want to see what's actually going on, you have to attach a debugger. And I'll talk about those kind of things later. Um, but um, most of those com objects are not exceptionally use useful anymore with IE because these days um, most of the com objects have the kill bit set in Windows. And you, just, you can no longer reach them from Win uh, IE unless the guy sitting in front of it clicks on OK three times, which I guess is pretty much OK because most people on Windows do that anyway. They don't read their message anymore. Just OK, OK, just let me continue. Um, so, but you can't just do it. You need user interaction. Um, so, but so some of these um, are kind of um, nasty. I think there's some heap overflows in there, but they're mostly no point references, though. Um, right, so, oh yeah, the other thing that I want to say about Combust is that it's binary only. So, um, it, it's got a lot of features. It's, you know, it does a lot of cool things that you want it to do, and it's very configurable, um, but it's binary. You can't extend it. If, if, if it's missing some very specific part that you want to do, that you can't do, you know, it's binary only, so. Unless you're a really good reverse engineer and you can put binary code in there, you can still extend it, but you know, that's a lot of work. You might just as well write something from scratch, which somebody did. Um, <laughs> um, and it's, a, it's basically the same thing as Combust. It's open source, but it lacks a lot of the feature that Combust has. Combust really is very, very configurable. Um, this one is not, um, but it's open source, so if you want to have these features in there, you can just hack on it. Um, it's written by a guy called Shane Hart. I don't know. I know how to pronounce his last name. Hertz? I don't know. Um, I haven't spoken to him, so. Um, but it looks, it looks uh, promising. Um, I haven't actually uh, toyed around with it much, but the things that I did see is that, you know, is that it's more limited than Combust right now. Or at least when I looked at it. You know, that was a couple of months ago, so they might have added more stuff in there. I don't know. Right, so the um, next tool is Fuzz server, which is written by uh, another guy from um, at stake or Symantec, um, which basically is a gate web client or a gateway fuzzer. And you know, it's also written in C. It's open source. I think it's made for Windows, but it might also work on Linux. Uh, right. And this is because it's got like cool ASCII stuff in there explaining um, how it works. And basically, you know, you've got your, your web client and your web proxy and you fuzz server, so you send a request, and basically what a fuzz server does is it does very trivial uh, HTTP or um, WDP fuzzing. Um, it's, I guess the kind of fuzz sets are somewhat outdated for these days. Um, so, but um, I've been told by a couple of people that this tool used to be used a lot, so I included it. Um, yeah, I haven't played around with it much, though. Right. 
oh, this, this one's really cool. This one got me, uh, you know, I missed a couple nights of sleep with this tool. Um, this is a, um, a kernel stress test tool developed by a FreeBSD kernel developer. And it's, it's amazingly cool. It fuzzes a lot of things. It does syscall fuzzing. It does socket fuzzing. It does some, some very cool stuff with your swap files. And one of the, um, the cool things about this tool is that the essence of the tool is chaos. The more chaos, the better. Um, and the other thing is that um, it requires uh, or tries to um, get low memory conditions. So the less memory you have, the better it is to fuzz with stress too. Uh, so if, if you're running FreeBSD in a VMware, you know, change the RAM to, I don't know, a gig to eight megabytes or something. And all of a sudden, you'll find lots and lots of bugs. Um, so um, as a stress test tool, and one of the cool things in there is, you know, in the make file, it's big honking warning. Do not run it as root, because lots of stuff will happen. Most likely, you won't be able to reboot anymore. <laughs> um, so, but if you go to his website, you get a large list, because this one looks pretty small, but he's, he kept updating it, because so, this one was done in, uh, this list from August, and I think the last update was from a week ago. So all the things he, find, if he finds with his fuzzer, um, they get up there, and if you, if you go to that website there, um, and you click on console lock, you get an entire stack dump, and um, some more, uh, you get the registers and things like that. So you get to see all the things that, go, that are wrong. And that's pretty cool about it. Um, so, and every once in a while, um, some of the stuff he finds, because uh, every once in a while he, he adds some stuff to his fuzzer, because um, he tries to fuzz specific areas of the kernel. And so every once in a while he adds stuff, and uh, I don't know, no, I didn't. Um, one of the things he, um, he didn't add in there, or at least I thought he didn't, um, was um, a fuzzer which fuzzes ELF files. If you load an ELF file, your, your kernel has to parse it. And there's a lot of data in there to parse. A lot of ways that things can really go wrong. And you know, I, had, I had done some very dumb fuzzing with, um, with the Mangle tool, which I described earlier. And I'd run it on FreeBSD as well. And I came across some things that FreeBSD kernel shouldn't do. And I mailed him about it, you know, um, should maybe have some similar stuff in there. And he, he mailed me back and he said, yes, actually, I do have it in there, but I can't put it out yet because the security guys are looking at it and we're trying to fix it. So, um, so um, the, the tool has got some things that aren't public yet, but uh, it's, it's a really cool one. Um, and basically, because they just keep finding new stuff with it, just keep running it. I think the latest one a couple of weeks ago was in the um, FreeBSD 6, you know, the one that got just released. Yeah, so some bugs were found in there. And I think they're even, they're even doing it on FreeBSD 7 these days. Um, all right, so um, Stress 2 is a really, really cool tool. And if, 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 you, if, you, um, yeah, if you ever get the chance to play with it, you definitely should. And did I mention? No, I didn't mention that yet. A friend of mine actually made a port of Stress 2 to macOS. Because, um, you know, macOS is basically, you know, the kernel is large parts of the kernel are FreeBSD. So um, also most of the syscalls are um, FreeBSD system calls. So uh, with minor modifications, this tool will work on macOS. Um, right, I don't have his email address somewhere on there, but if you, want, if you want the tool, come up to me later and I'll give you his email address. All right, so this is stress two. And then the next one's bugger. And this one's actually neat because it's sort of a new approach to fuzzing. Um, basically, it's written by Mikhail Zalewski. And it's, it's, it's um, uh, basically it uses pre-trace to fuzz. And what it does is, because um, what Michael Zalewski has is, if you've got um, large commercial tools, um, they'll use encryption and uh, checksums and compression and all sorts of things that you really don't want to build fuzzers for because it, it takes days or weeks to do that. And so what it did is, is he said, well, why not just change the client into a fuzzer? So he has um, a I think about 500 lines of C code or something, code which um, attaches to your normal client and then just um, make subtle changes to the data you're going to send to your server before it gets encrypted, before it gets compressed, and before any checksumming is done. So this makes it a lot easier. And it's, it's a proof of concept because it's, it's really not that big, but it ha I think it has an enormous amount of potential. I think this is one of the things that um, people should really look at um, in, the f um, in the future. Um, for fuzzing, because, I mean, it, it's pretty neat. Right, that's bugger. The next one is um, Shredder, <laughs> um, which is basically, there was a company called Rapid7 Security, 
And a couple of years ago, they made an SSH fuzzer. And you know, it just does pre-key key exchange stuff. So only phase one things. Um, and basically, they found a whole range of things in a whole range of products. And um, they didn't release their tool because it's, it's a commercial one. But they did release um, 666 files of all the different kind of bugs they have. So what I did is I made a, a Perl script, or yeah, mine's a Perl script, which is sort of a small fake SSH daemon. And it just takes one of these files and runs the mangle tool over it. So it takes a, a in somewhat semi-valid SSH file which has already been used to fuzz stuff and it just suddenly uh, um, just changes bytes in there. You know, it does it, um, it's um, very dumb fuzzing, but um, you get some results with it. Um, so you, didn't, you don't get their tools, but you get, um, you know, you get their files, you know, the, the things they actually, you get their data. So that's good enough. You know, you can build a tool around their data. And um, basically in their advisory, some of the things it does is, um, you know, some packet lengths, string lengths, and uh, some padding. Um, so basically, uh, all the things before the key exchange stuff, they try to fuzz. Um, yeah, and yeah, they've released those, um, the, the data for that. And if you see the list of stuff they've broken, it's a fair amount of stuff. You know, not surprisingly, OpenSSH is not on there, because it was, you know, despite the fact that it has had some security bugs, it was actually written with a lot of security in mind. So, but there's the stuff in there, you know, is the, um, some of the things you see advisors for every once in a while, you know, to put the SSH client and F secure SSH server and all sorts of things. But, you know, OpenSSH is not in there. Um, I'm guessing if, if you would make a very detailed um, SSH fuzzer which covers almost the entire code paths and you um, put a lot of um, uh, tests in there and things like that, you might be able to trigger something in OpenSSH. But, that would be a, a huge time investment. But if someone is up for that, uh, that would be really cool. Right, so SFuzz, um, which is another uh, small fuzzing tool I made. Basically, it's sort of an extension of my system call fuzzer. What it does is it takes a, a group of system calls. In this case, anything that creates sockets. And then you create a socket and you, uh, you randomly give it a protocol and a family, and uh, what's the argument? I forgot. Uh, basically, um, so you fill in the three arguments of the socket function randomly, and when you, get, when you get an invalid socket, you just go back to your loop. When you get a valid socket, you just do um, random socket operations on that socket. And um, yeah, one of the things is if you're going to try this, you have to watch out, because you also get, you get Unix domain sockets, and they tend to, um, is it domain sockets? Yes, I think so. Yes, they tend to create files, and if, if you run this thing um, a lot, let, let's say you give it a million operations, you get a million files. Um, so that's kind of annoying. And th these are, because it's like, it's files with random names, so it's not, it's kind of annoying to delete all of them. Uh, yeah, I've been there, you know, accidentally deleted some other stuff that I did need. Um, so, and one of the things I did is um, it fuzzed, um, two bugs in the Linux kernel, which I will demonstrate. Mm. <coughs> Don't need those anymore. Right, yes, so this is it, sfuzz. And well, um, one of the reasons, uh, actually the only reason why I'm running sfuzz in GDB is because I have a bug in there somewhere. I haven't figured out where yet. But if I don't run it in a debugger, it goes dog slow. If I run it in a debugger, it goes normally. I don't know why, but for some reason it does that. I mean, if, if, if you want, I can demonstrate it. Like, um, this is, right, so, you know, this is, it's still looking for the first socket. You know, this is the first one. So this is dog slow, but if I do it in a debugger, bam, well, okay, it's already fuzzed the bug in the kernel. Um, but uh, let me show you again. Um, right, so it goes a lot faster, right? So it's got a, a bug in the kernel, and if, if you check the oops message, you, get, you have a null pointing reference in the Bluetooth stack. Yeah, it doesn't say Bluetooth stack here, but if you, right, if you check it, 
Yeah, okay, give me a sec. Huh, break, yeah. So, uh, you can see right here that it's in the Bluetooth stack, because socket in the 31, that's the, uh, I think, that's the one that says, hi, I'm Bluetooth. Um, so this is definitely a bug in the Bluetooth stack. Right, so that was SFOS. Right, so this is, um, I think the one, the one you guys just saw. Oops. Then this is pretty annoying. I keep hitting it with my foot. Um, right. So this is the um, the uh, the bug in the Bluetooth stack. Right. And another thing I made is called DHCP fuzz, which sends out very bogus DHCP uh, messages. And um, I also have a demonstration of this. But it basically it broke TCP dump in verbose mode. Um, basically, it's sort of a denial of service. Um, Sometimes, um, certain type of packages, TCP dump takes two or three minutes to parse a single packet, which you know gives you a huge uh, things of packets that can't parse right now. Then, if you send out a lot of those packets, you know TCP dump will pretty much do nothing. Um, the other tool is DHCP dump, which is apparently used a lot by some administrators. Um, it's got no point references, stack smashes, endless loops, lots of stuff in there, and I'll demonstrate that. Mm, don't need this one anymore. Don't need this one either. Ah, only three of them left, so that's good. Right, so already have this running. Um, the thing you see here, this is um, DH, uh, DHCP dump. This is my, debu uh, my uh, debugger attached to it. And this is um, my fuzzing script. Uh, the reason why I'm doing preloading here is because I'm using um, uh, net packet in Perl, and um, that library, Excuse me. Um, that library has uh, a call to sleep in there, so you know it's kind of annoying to only f uh, fire out one packet every second. So I'm preloading sleep to uh, instead of sleeping for a second, sleeping for one tenth of a second. Um, and if you do this, and it keeps running, and if you give it two seconds or a bit more, it should have already broken. Okay. I hope this is one of the cases where it blows up in my face because. Yeah, okay, so it broke, yes. I'm saved. And this lost my demonstration, so I'm happy that none of my demonstrations failed. Um, so this is um, a bug, and I don't know exactly which one, but let's see if we can figure it out. It's probably a no point reference. No, it's not. Right, okay, this is actually, this is the stack smash. This is cool. Um, you can't see that it's a stack smash, because um, uh, a pointer got overwritten. But if you look at this pointer, it says um, basically 36, 31, 2A, 31. That, if you translate that to ASCII, it says um, 6, 2, dot, 1. So that's, base, that's data that, you know, ASCII data that um, you, you generated, which um, in this case um, went over a pointer. And eight, the instruction points also got smashed, but you don't reach that yet because this pointer gets um, fed to. Um, String length, but you can you can make it point to something that isn't um, that is valid data, and then basically you get an uh, instruction pointer overwrite. Right. Okay. Right on time. Uh, right. So the the HTTP first. Um, the last one. Um, hmm. Okay. Right, I wanted to do a demonstration for this, a demonstration, but apparently I forgot to prepare that. So if you want to see a demonstration of Scappy later, just grab me and I'll show you some really, really, really neat stuff that you can do with Scappy. Because I'm, uh, I'm, it was kind of like, when I first um, saw a talk of Philip Biondi, who's the guy who made Scappy, I was blown away, you know, my world was turned upside down because of the things that you can do with Scappy. Um, yeah, because uh, Scappy on itself deserves, uh, you know, a talk of two, three hours on itself. But, I'm going to try and convince you guys that Scappy is cool. Um, you can create almost any kind of packet, l l uh, network packet with Scappy in a single line of code. Um, so that's why Scappy is so amazingly cool. And um, since a month or two ago, um, Scappy um, had some new uh, code in there which makes it a fuzzer. 
And one of the things that's really cool about Scappy is that um, basically it's got support for um, three dozen protocols or something. And what the, the fuzzing function does is it just takes the protocol and just goes you know, randomly through all the arguments. Just, you know, if it's integer, it'll just put some stuff in there, some random stuff in there, and it's an endless loop. And that kind of gives you um, potentially complete code coverage of the protocol. Uh, obviously, that's not going to always work because um, you want to have some things in it. Like if, if you have a protocol that says, I'm only going to parse version 4 of this protocol, um, you want to override that particular um, element in the protocol and say it's version 4. And you can do that with Scappy. Basically, um, with Scappy, every layer of um, your network is an object. And your object, um, you can basically say, this element is going to be something that, something that I want it to be. And then just um, uh, say fuzz. And it'll just fuzz it. And you can, um, when I was at Paxec with Philip, he had just implemented the, um, the um, uh, fuzzing stuff. And I was like, um, why don't you try it against uh, the ISC NTPD, the network time demon? Because it's pretty bad code, and you should probably find stuff in there. So he ran it against, which is, actually, I wanted to give a demonstration here, but I didn't, have, I didn't prepare for that. Um, he ran it against the ISC NTPD. And you know, not surprisingly, within a couple of seconds, we got a, a seg fault. Um, yeah, I really wanted to show you guys a demonstration, but yeah, well. We should check out Scappy. It is so much more than just a fuzzle. It does really neat stuff. And the other thing is that um, it's, uh, and I can actually show this, um, it's really easy to add new protocols. So um, Scappy doesn't have support for um, um, Sun RPC, but If you just do this, now Scappy has support for um, some basic Sun RPC stuff. So it's exceptionally easy to add protocols to um, Scappy. And the other thing is, if you're going to have stuff that um, generates, um, you know, like um, checksums and stuff like that, you can easily um, say this field will need this function to generate um, um, a CRC2 or some other kind of checksum stuff. So enough about Scappy. I'm kind of in love with Scappy, I guess. It's a real neat tool. Also, I mean, you can do anything with Scappy. Just the, the um, while, while I was preparing for my talk, um, somebody came sitting next to me, and he wanted to build a uh, MAC address brute forcer, because when you've got port security. And he's like, oh, I don't want to write it in C, because it's going to take me a couple hours and so much code. And I'm like, do it in Scappy. And um, turns out, you can do it in a one-liner. So. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not, this is where I'm kind of done with the first part. Um, there are tons of more fuzzers. It's certainly not a complete list. These are some of the ones that I really like and some of the ones that are publicly known to do find lots of cool stuff. Um, but fuzzers are they're basically the, the, the cool thing these days. You know? And everybody's developing more and new fuzzers and cooler fuzzers. Um, if, if, if you want to fuzz something, uh, Google is usually, should be your first thing. Go to Google, say, you know, fuzzing and then the protocol or the file type or the API you want to fuzz. And if you're a bit lucky, you'll find somebody who made a fuzzer for it. If not, you'll have to start from, from scratch. Um, the other thing is that there are piles and piles of um, private fuzzers and, um, more specifically, there are piles and piles of commercial fuzzers, you know, things that cost 20,000 euros and stuff like that. Um, so I can't afford those, but I've been told by some people that they're really cool. Um. So the second part of my talk, yeah, kind of on schedule, so that's The first thing that should probably come up is, you know, what kind of language, if you're going to write from scratch, what kind of language do you do? And these are just some pointers of things that I've come across. And um, So feel free to ignore them if, if you don't think it's true, but these are some of the things that, um, how I feel about writing fuzzers is that scripting languages usually um, are a lot um, better or easier because um, you can write less code and have the same thing that, you know, um, the same thing that you would have in uh, C code. Um, to give you an example and come back to Scappy, is that the, um, the Microsoft um, bug where they had a bug in IP option parsing, and it was a, um, a proof of concept code public for that, was a piece of C code, which was about 150 lines of C code. And in Scappy, that's a single line of code. 
So, um, in, and Scappy is written in Python, by the way. So that's one line of Python code, basically. Um, so scripting languages are really cool, and um, it goes a lot faster if you write stuff in scripting language, usually. Um, the other thing is obviously that, because um, scripting languages are generally slow, um, is that your fuzzing on itself will be slower. And um, one of the things I've noticed about Python is that it's really slow compared to like Perl or something. But you can optimize Python code, so that's good. Um, most people also recommend using scripting languages because it's just easier to write stuff. However, uh, one of the things that I've come, uh, I've kind of um, experienced is that um, these kind of um, scripting languages, they're really cool if you want to do um, like ASCII-based protocols and stuff like that. But if you've got stuff where you've got um, a lot of binary data, um, it gets kind of messy. I mean, like in Perl and Python, you've got to use pack and things like that. In C, you don't need those things. It's all native in C, basically. So if you're going to do a lot of binary stuff, um, it's probably not a bad idea to use C. Um, right. Besides all of that, if you don't like any of the languages and you, know, you want to write something in Dylan or uh, Lisp or um, Smalltalk or whatever, you know, go ahead. You, know, you should choose a language that you're comfortable with. But these are just some of the, um, the things I've come across. Right. So um, the other thing is uh, smart fuzzers um, or not smart fuzzers. Um, basically, you've got two kinds of fuzzers. You've got dumb fuzzers and intelligent fuzzers. And the difference is that with a dumb fuzzer is that usually it takes you between a couple of minutes and an hour or so to write one. So there, you know, you can sit down, almost get one immediately, and just start fuzzing. Um, the thing is that um, with dumb fuzzers, you usually don't know the specifics of a protocol, or don't want to know the specifics of a protocol or a file layout or um, some API, and you just um, you look at what's valid and then just change some things in there and pass it on to uh, whatever you want to try to fuzz. Um, that's uh, shockingly effective, um, honestly. I mean, like the, the Mangle stuff, which is, does pretty much this, the same thing, uh, really took me by surprise. I never imagined that you could break IE and PHP and pretty much a lot of all other stuff with it. Uh, but it does work. Um, the, other, the, the one thing is with dumb fuzzers is that if there's going to be compression and encryption and checksums, that you're not going to get far. Um, building intelligence fuzzer is basically the, the opposite. You know, you know the protocol and the file layout, and you're going to um, implement the um, the fuzzing. Uh, the, excuse me. You're going to implement the uh, encryption and compression and checksums and whatever you need. Um, so building intelligence fuzzers takes a while. Um, obviously, um, they'll be able to fuzz a lot more and go a lot deeper in a lot of code paths. So intelligent fuzzers um, almost always give you better results than dumb fuzzers. Um, so it's kind of a, a trade-off. I mean, if, if you just want to go out and find one cool bug, then dumb fuzzers usually will give you good, good results. If you want to try and get complete or try to get complete code coverage, um, you probably end up building an intelligent fuzzer and spending a couple of days or weeks or even months uh, developing one. Um, so intelligent fuzzers take a lot longer to write, but they give you an awful lot of things, usually. Right. So um, some of the things that um, are interesting to fuzz, um, um, binary files, um, you know, uh, movie stuff, um, and uh, all, you know, lot, lots of um, programs that interpret them, you know, QuickTime, Real Player, Media Player, M Player, you know, tons of stuff. And those are interesting. Um, say for executable files, um, you know, the Mako and Elf and, what, and whatnot. Because, um, you know, you can pass those to a, kern to a kernel, and if, if they kind of make a crucial mistake there, like, let's say they, they take some length and they cause a heap overflow or whatever, you know, that's a local root and that's a local kernel bug. So those are kind of interesting. Um, some more like uh, open off like Office documents, like open office um, graphic files. And another neat one is file systems, because um, for example, on, on Linux, you've got like uh, tons and tons of file system support. You know, you've got, you know, like with the exception of ZFS, you know, you've got like JFS and UFS, XFS, Riser, and about 20 other file systems. And um, all, all of these, the kernel has to like parse all these file systems. And there's lots and lots of things in there. Um, when I um, had used a mangle tool over um, RiserFS, when I hit, right when I hit the enter button, I got a kernel panic. So um, lots of things that you can do there. Um, not binary files. Um, you can, uh, you know, stuff like XML configuration files, those kind of things. Um, you probably want to have uh, 
smart fuzzers there, or at least take a, um, a known file that's known to be good, and then have something that's somewhat smart that can say, this looks like a string, so I'll change it into something smaller, or put percent n, or whatever in it. Um, so, but usually you want to have some kind of intelligence when you're going to um, uh, parse stuff that's not binary. Right. Um, yeah, more stuff to fuzz. Um, you can fuzz, you know, FTP protocol, obviously HTTP, DHCP, NTP. You know, any protocol you can think of, you can probably fuzz. Um, one of the interesting things about FTP is that you've got um, a lot of F FTP fuzzers out there, but at least it looks to me that they're all exceptionally trivial. You know, they take a list of the commands you can and give in the A and B and, and some, you know, the more advanced FTP fuzzers, they try some globbing bugs and maybe direct traversals, and that's good if you want to um, find bugs in tutor, FT, tutor FTPD or something on Windows, which nobody uses. But if, if you want to, uh, you know, try and be serious about it and see if you can find some, some neat stuff in, um, like, pro FTPD or something, um, you, you're going to have to look at stuff like race conditions, you know, um, signal race conditions, because you can cause signals with that, like some timing issues. And nobody's ever looked at that with FTP fuzzing. Kind of amazes me, because my guess is that you're going to find a lot of cool stuff there. Right, so that's network protocols. APIs, system calls, are the obvious one. Um, graphic libraries are probably the also exceptionally um, obvious ones, because they're going to be parsing a lot of, a lot of um, length fields and stuff like that. And you know, you, you just got to get it wrong once, and bam, you know, there's a heap overflow there or something. Right, so even more stuff to fuzz. Um, SUID files, which is what I talked about in like, the third slide or something. The, um, um, where you can do like arguments, obviously, environment variables, signals, uh, standard input, and for example, you know, also open a lot of file scriptures and then you know, open 50,000 file files and then don't close them and um, call a suit file. And for example, if you do that in Solaris, you know, you open 50,000 files and you run the ping, you get a seg fault. And you know, if there are any OpenBZ developers um, in the room, they'll probably go like, yeah, we know those kind of bugs. Base, base, <laughs> I, so I hear some people laughing, so some people know what kind of bugs uh, I'm talking about. Um, but basically what happens when opening a lot of files is if you've got select loops and stuff like that, um, you've got something which is called an FD set array, which is a, um, a static array on the stack usually. And it usually can only hold like 1,000 or 2,000 um, files. Basically it's got one bit for every file set. So that means if, you got, uh, if it's got support for 1,024 files and, you open, and you've got 1,025 files open, it'll write one bit beyond that array. So those, those kind of bugs are pretty neat. And like, um, uh, like on the, like the BSDs, they fix most of those. Um, on Linux, they're pretty much not exploitable because of very strict R limits. But stuff like HP Unix and Solaris and a lot of other things, you know, just if you open a lot of file scripts and run suits, nine chances out of 10, you'll, you'll get some, uh, some very interesting bugs there. So and you can fuzz those things. Um, I've, I've never seen anybody do it, but that would be really interesting. Um, and pretty much any input suit can take, and it, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of input. Right. So um, if you're going to write fuzzing tools, um, there will be some, some things that you want to look at. Okay. Um, obviously, um, size fields, uh, you want to look at strings. And then, like, things that uh, terminate some kind of data, and things that mark its beginning. Um, right, so let's look at size fields. Um, obviously, um, one of the interesting ones is um, negative values. I'm sure you've all heard of it or seen some of those things, but um, they do cause a lot of problems. Uh, you know, if you give a minus one in some stuff, you know, um, that might cause problems. You know, some more examples. You know, um, stuff around like the the boundaries, like where you get integer overflows. Those are usually interesting. Like um, like um, 7F, FF, and then 0, 8, 0, 0, 0, so st some stuff like that. Um, they can cause under-indexing, for example, um, negative values. Um, they can also cause, you know, if you do, just do a bound check and you sort that stuff in assign a teacher, uh, and you check if it's bigger than a summary, and then use that value to put in a copy loop, it'll get cost to do an unsigned teacher, and very, very bad things happen. Um, the other thing that is sometimes interesting is like if you've got binary protocols where you've got a uh, length field saying the string that's coming is 10 bytes long and then you've got a string there which is not 10 bytes long but it's 
20 bytes long. And then the program will be like, oh, it's 10 bytes long, that's okay. I'll just use string copy and copy that string into my buffer. So you know, the length feels right, but the string itself is wrong. So these kinds of things, somewhat rare, but they do happen. So you should definitely, if, if you've got these kind of protocols, you should look at that. Those things are interesting. The other ones, obviously, uh, large positive numbers. Um, they can cause, if, if you use them with multiplication, they can cause integer overflows. Um, if they're um, by themselves unsigned, they can obviously cause integer overflows. Um, yeah. The last one, which is using very small numbers. And that might sound a bit odd, but all too often you see code like there where they've got, you know, the length which you control and they've done some bound checking, like it's not bigger than or maximum value and it's not smaller than zero, then it's okay. And then they come to this part and they say length and it, at this part they're assuming it's bigger than two or at least two. And it, but you've given in zero or one and basically you're under-indexing by a couple bytes and for example, you know, for string termination or something and they'll add a zero byte in there and if you're under-indexing and this is on the heap, you've got a lot of problems. Right, so th these are some of the size fields that um, you want to take into account. Right. So, um, strings. Um, obviously, um, you want to have long strings, really long ones, you know, just in case um, somebody left a, um, a trivial stack smashes or some stuff like that in their code. This is kind of the classic. And um, then um, also format string box, you want to look for those, so you put some format string stuff in there. Um, the thing I've seen which is kind of odd or at least a bit disappointing is that um, a lot of the fuzzing tools out there that are going to fuzz for format string box, they're going to use one or two percent ends or they're going to use percent s or something like that. That's not that good. It's not really a good idea to do, do it that way. What you want to do is you want to use lots of percent ends. You want to use 15 or 20 of them. The reason is that um, uh, if you use percent s, even if you use 10 or 20 of them, if the stack is laid out just right, nothing's going to crash. If you're going to use percent ends, even three or four of them, if the stack is laid out exactly right, I mean, it's kind of rare, but I've seen it happen. If it's laid out exactly right, you know, three or four percent ends, it's still not going to crash. And obviously, you want to get it to crash. So, you know, use 15 or 20 of them. And, you know, it's almost guaranteed that it'll crash. I've never seen a stack that's that well laid out um, by accident. Um, another interesting thing in there is um, if you've got like strings um, and you've got some binary data in there, um, odd things might happen. Um, you know, you can usually, if you, if you want to generate those, just grab stuff, get stuff out of defu random or something. Um, but if you look at the kind of C code that's there, th and this is very common code, by the way, it's exceptionally common code, um, where basically you've got um, uh, uh, B is a string you control, you know, you've just read it off the network and you're putting it into this kind of thing. And, you know, go up to the first zero byte and then plus one, you do memory location A and then you, um, you go, you scroll um, all the way over the array, say as long as what's in, in B is equals to, to ASCII A, just increase B. And then um, after the loop, um, you want to um, jump over another one. Um, what, what people uh, forget here is that you should, you know, in these kind of cases, check for zero bytes, because if you don't, you know, um, basically uh, the string length was used, will go until a zero byte, and then the second B++ will jump over the zero byte and um, heap overflow. And it, this kind of code is exceptionally common. Right, so that's, oh, right, more strings. Um, other things is like, um, when something expects a string, don't give it a string. Um, Lots of null point references this way. Um, if, if you've got like single threaded demons and you've got null point references, that's a, uh, that's a, denial, a pretty nasty denial surface. Um, the other ones, um, like if you've got lengths in ASCII values, that's pretty common. And basically just um, try to do, um, keep the size things in mind and just use them in ASCII values. And this is fairly common. Um, a couple of months ago I discovered a bug in Ethereal where it does this CC parsing, which is distributed, uh, distributed compiling. And it's gotten, it has an ASCII protocol where they say um, an argument, and then they say the length of my argument, and then they give you the argument. And the code basically just took the length, and put it in the sign teacher, you know, said, oh, it's smaller than my buffer. Let's give that length to memcopy, and there was a stack smash. Um, 
right, so that, that's kind of like, um, these are kind of like the strings that you want to keep in mind uh, if you're going to um, look at stuff that's going to be written in C. Um, so more interesting things, which is um, usually more uh, web related, is um, uh, SQL injection stuff. Um, though it's not always that, uh, at least not um, related as in like um, forms or stuff, but for example, um, a couple of months ago, a friend of mine came across um, some commercial product which had a web server and he connected to it with a fake browser and he had SQL injection in his browser version and it would trigger, the, um, it would trigger an SQL bu injection bug in this commercial product. So it's not, all, it's not always in like um, posting to forums and stuff. You can have SQL injection in other places as well. But usually it's in you know, web related forums and stuff like that. Yeah, cross site scripting, I'm sure everybody's heard about them, you know, <laughs> some JavaScript alert or something. Um, so yeah, um, if, if you're into cross site scripting and stuff, you can, you can probably fuzz a lot of cross site scripting stuff. Um, a bit more damaging stuff is uh, directory traversals. Um, if it's like FTP stuff, you can usually get out of, like in Windows, or at least there have been a lot of them, you can get out of sort of a, you can get out of your true root or something like that. Um, uh, in like web servers and stuff, it can get pretty nasty because if you can do directory traversals, you might be able to get command execution from there. Kind of, it kind of depends on the way things have been made. Um, and then the, the, the last one of strings is f command injection. Um, like backticks, for example, um, or uh, you know, um, semicolon or something like that. And it, Every time I find one of those, it kind of amazes me that people still make these kind of bugs. I mean, you've got like some high profile demons and stuff out there where there's this kind of trivial command injection. You give it something that'll give you a shell as an argument, do backticks, and you get a remote root shell or something. It's, yeah. So th th these are kind of the strings that you want to look out um, um, when you're um, fuzzing. All right. Um, some more stuff. Um, basically, um, Things that terminate or um, something or that mark its beginning. Um, you know, you can have like null bytes or just four zeros or you know, in, um, or um, brackets stuff like that. Um, and so basically, you know, kind of things that you want to do is like um, like not use them and just have it endlessly going on. For example, or um, put data that wasn't supposed to be off there off there anyway and see what happens. Um, if, if you can like, um, if there are ways in the protocol to escape them, you know, um, to escape some stuff. Try to escape um, some of these things that mark some beginnings or endings. Uh, it can get, it can lead to um, surprising results. Uh, and then um, put several of those off each other and see what happens. Right. Um, right. Um, how do you want your fuzzer to actually work? The way I usually do stuff is you got uh, you know you define some states of stuff that you want to do, and then um, I just use uh, ran functions to decide what state I want to use and then just fire that off. And that works pretty well. Um, usually when you do these kind of things, um, you'll be working in an endless loop. Um, yeah, some of the, you know, the, the random stuff, you know, ran, arc for random, and some more stuff. Uh, def random and def u random are exceptionally useful. Um, def random might not be that useful for fuzzing because in fuzzing you want to do stuff very, very quickly and it doesn't have to be cr cryptographically secure. Um, so def random might not be that good because um, it's slow, but def u random is wonderful. Um, if you're gonna fuzz, it's like you, know, you can't live without def u random if you're gonna fuzz, or at least I can't live without def u random. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's usually an endless loop that you do these kind of things. And the other thing is that usually, and this is, tends to be more towards fault injection, um, if you have a, um, a very detailed analysis of what you're going to fuzz and you've got that all written down and you've got months of development because these kind of sequential fuzz usually take a lot of time to develop. Um, you've got a whole list of stuff you want to do and you just have a for loop. You go from first test case till the last test case and it just run down your list. And that's usually uh, finite in time to do these kind of things. So these are usually two kind of things that you want to decide uh, how you're going to fuzz stuff. Right. Um, the other thing which is um, uh, interesting in design fuzz is that um, you're going to either uh, mutate data or generate data. And mutating data is usually a lot easier because you take data that you know is going to be valid. Uh, if, you, if you've got a protocol, you just you sniff it and you say, this is valid because you know, I've seen it work, it's valid. And you just put it in whatever you're going to fuzz and just um, mutate it. Put, you know, keep it as much intact as it was, but change a few things in there and you know, run it through. So data mutation is usually very easy to make. 
Um, and it is amazingly effective. Um, yeah, it is. Um, so, the next one, data generation. This, um, this one takes longer, because um, you, know, you have to figure out what you want to generate, and then still write code to generate it. Um, so it takes a lot more time to, um, to, um, to program it, but um, you can uh, cover a lot more um, code paths, usually. Right. Some uh, annoying things I've, um, I've encountered while, um, while developing fuzzers is, um, first of all, you've got bugs hiding behind bugs, where um, one bug is so obvious that it, one bug is so annoying that it will always trigger on something, and you will not be able to trigger a bug behind it. So that one kind of sucks. Um, in, there are a few cases where you could still, might be possible to get around the first bug and second bug, but because you're fuzzing, the first bug will always get triggered. So that one really sucks. Um, user friendliness is, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, it's, it's really bad. Um, yeah, honestly, I mean, it's so annoying to fuzz some kind of program and every time it gets a packet, you get a pop-up saying, this, this packet is invalid. I'm like, I know it's invalid. I want you to break, you know, and usually it stops processing anything until you click OK. You know, so it's kind of, user friendliness is, is really kind of annoying when you're fuzzing stuff. Um, yeah, memory leaks, um, arguably, you can say memory leaks or bugs or security bugs, um, but if it's like memory leaks, like one or two bytes every time, it's not that much and you usually don't feel it, but they can get pretty annoying when fuzzing because if, if you're spitting out uh, a lot of, lots and lots of packets in an endless loop, um, you know, every time you send out some kind of packet, it might leak one or two bytes. So after, you know, five, five million test runs, it's, you've leaked five million bytes. Um, so, and sometimes, the leak can get bigger. So, you know, if, if you're going to be fuzzing something and it leaks a lot of stuff and sucks up a couple of gigs in, in a couple of minutes, you won't be, fuzz you won't be fuzzing it for long. Um, right. The other thing is, um, yeah, programs that are slow in general, um, they're, they're annoying to fuzz because you just have to wait a lot, a lot longer for your results. Um, usually, though, um, slow programs are interesting to fuzz because, um, I mean, if they're slow for what they're doing, because that means the programmer didn't really, probably didn't know what he was doing, and that doesn't usually also reflect in the quality of his code, I mean, like, in terms of security. So they might be annoying to fuzz, but they're, on the other side, they're also interesting, because you just know there are going to be bugs there. Um, and, of course, you know, you can only fuzz what's configured. If things haven't been configured, I mean, you won't be able to fuzz those code paths, obviously. And then the other thing, which is, um, I've talked about it before, but which is really annoying when you're fuzzing is, Checksums, encryption, compression, all those things. Especially if it's like if it's n like uh, compression or encryption, that's not publicly known. I mean, it's not an open standard. It's the stuff that you have to reverse engineer. That's pure hell. Um, right. So, getting rid of these annoyances. Um, bug hiding behind a bug. Um, if it's open source, um, track the bug down and just fix it. If it's binary, um, you're kind of not so lucky because if you can track it down and patch it in the binary, I mean, depending upon what kind of bug it is, it might be trivial, um, but it might also be very hard. Um, you might also be able, uh, which I'll cover in the next one, but um, if, if it's binary, you might be able to, if, if you can isolate where it is, you might be able to preload it. Um, so yeah, um, the second one is user friendliness. That one's really annoying. Um, you can usually preload the stuff. If you get like a pop-up for something, preload it and just get rid of that pop-up. Um, the other thing is that um, on macOS, you've got something which is called Apple Script. And what's so cool about Apple Script is, well, I'll show you that in the next slide. So, but keep in mind that Apple Script is really cool um, for uh, helping you fuzz stuff. Um, memory leaks, um, which is basically, you know, arguably um, a bug behind a bug, because memory leaks on themselves are bugs, I guess. Um, well, again, you know, if the same rules for bug behind a bug apply, you know, if it's open source, fix the memory leak if you can find it. If it's binary, you know, if you can find it, then if you can fix it, because um, binary is obviously a lot harder to patch than when you've got source code. Um, but if you can fix it, you know, try and fix it, because memory leaks do matter when you're, um, when you're fuzzing stuff. And then for, uh, like, the other stuff, like slow programs and fuzzing what's being configured and encryption stuff, um, you know, 
there's usually no easy way to get around. Maybe configuration, maybe if, if you know what to configure and not, not, what not. But all the other things, there's no easy way to get around them. Um, you're just going to have to deal with them. So yeah, that, that really sucks. Um, so, but getting around some user friendliness, um, speci specifically on Mac OS, um, you've got AppleScript. And AppleScript is sort of a programming language, but it looks more like English than a programming language. Um, the, if you can see the code here, basically this is um, something I've used to fuzz Internet Explorer on um, Mac OS. And basically what you do is you, you know, tell Internet application Internet Explorer and then basically have a while loop in there and then open a Gopher URL. And this is pretty cool because in, in Internet Explorer, um, you, you don't have refresh when you're doing Gopher. You've got refresh in HTML, you've got no refresh in Gopher. And you could hit the um, refresh button a million times, but you know, your fingers start hurting or maybe they, they might even start to bleed, I don't know. Um, but if you've got AppleScript, you don't need those things. AppleScript will do that for you. You'll, say, you'll tell AppleScript, you know, do that what I would usually do and it'll just do it. And besides the fact that you will save um, you have a lot of pain in your fingers. Um, it'll be faster because um, you know, refreshing. You know, you got human interaction, but this is just you know, this is just automated. So Apple Script's a godsend um, if you're going to fuss stuff on macOS. But at the same time, it can cause problems because some applications on macOS um, they either don't implement Apple Script and then you can't use it, or they've implemented really, really badly. So badly that um, when you just when you try to write some um, uh, some Apple script code, the, the thing will just crash when you're trying to communicate it with it. So, but besides that, Apple script's really, really cool. Right. Um, determining um, how stuff fails, because um, I mean, it might sound a bit obvious, but sometimes it's kind of nice to have some pointers towards how, to, how these kind of things fail. Um, obviously, you know, crashes, Usually, those are pretty easy to detect, um, but you know, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And very, um, very small snippet on the next slide. Uh, huge memory consumptions. They can usually be found with default tools, and um, I have a slide about that as well. Uh, reboots. Yes, I mean usually you notice a reboot. So um, the same thing with hangs. You can usually notice them, um, but yeah, that kind of depends what kind of hang, and because sometimes um, you know. Sometimes you feel hangs, but sometimes you just don't. I mean, if you don't, if you were look, if you're not looking at the application specifically, you might not feel it in your operating system. It depends on the bug. Right. So crashes. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of obvious, but it looks cool though, doesn't it? Um, right. So core down, attach debugger, and I'll be talking about uh, debuggers quickly um, in a couple of slides. Um, so that's basically you know this it crashed, and you know in this case it's pretty easy to determine what's going on. Um, huge memory consumptions. This is, this is from a real case, by the way. Um, this is, uh, I was doing some fuzzing on Internet Explorer and um, I made some uh, bitmap fuzzing tools and at some point I came across some bitmap and um, you know, my mouse was hardly moving and you know, th things were going very, very badly and you know, there was a huge load. So I hit Alt Control Delete and I go to performance and usually you, know, you see the page file uses history and Basically, all my physical memory just was gone. You know, Internet Explorer had just eaten all of it. So, and you know, it's easy to see it here. You know, and then at the you know the after picture, after Internet Explorer has died, after I've killed it, you see all the performance. You know, it's all coming back. So it, it's kind of nice to see it in the graphical way. Um, so, but usually it's easy to detect these kind of things. Um, yeah, a reboot. Um, a while ago. Um, I was fortunate enough to be at somebody, uh, be at a friend's place who had a Cisco, and I figured, you know, I've never fuzzed a Cisco before, so let's do that. And this was the result I got. Um, I, haven't, I haven't played with it before because I know very little about Cisco devices, but it was fun though to see it break. And then you get, you know, some stuff in there, some registers, and then Cisco, decide, Cisco um, realizes it has crashed and it reboots. So it's kind of neat to see those kind of things. But um, hangs is, yeah, it's not an Internet Explorer thing. Um, basically, you know, if, if your CPU um, memory usage for some application um, never drops until you kill it, you know something's up. Right. 
So, um, seeing more than just a crash. Um, this is just a couple of pointers. Um, I really don't have time to go into detail on any of these things, but if you're interested in some of these things, you should stick around for next talk by Richard. Um, he'll be giving you a really cool tour of um, some of the things in IDA Pro, which is, which I mentioned here, um, and how you can um, figure out some structures um, of, binary, of uh, binaries and how you can use those for um, fuzzing, for example. Um, so, but, um, you know, if, if you're fuzzing something, you know, try to attach a, a debugger. You know, you've seen GDB, but um, the, the thing about GDB is that it's not really that wonderful. I mean, it's nice if, if, if you have your code compiled with debug and all these kind of things and you've sprinkled some printfs around and things like that. Um, but if you're going to fuzz things that um, will create threads and that will fork and that will call the execute system call, GDB is kind of bad because GDB can't handle threads that well. It basically breaks on a lot of thread stuff. Uh, execute system call is just as bad. Fork kind of depends. If, you, if you're lucky, it doesn't. It does work. If you're not lucky, it doesn't. Um, all the debug is one of the uh, Windows debuggers. It's pretty neat. I've done looked at some of that stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, WinDBG is uh, sort of like AudioDBG, but it's made by Microsoft. Uh, Softeyes is um, kind of like the, one of the huge debuggers in Windows. It's kernel debugger, and you know, if something um, breaks, you can get it to pop up. Uh, so this is just some of the uh, debugs that you might want to uh, look at. Um, these assemblers can also be helpful if, if you fuss something and you know, you've got an idea where it's gone wrong, but you don't know exactly what's gone wrong. You can fire up your, deep, uh, your disassembler and look at the entire program or large parts of the program. Um, IDA Pro is obviously, I mean, this, this one's kind of unfair because like IDA Pro is like, um, it's like the disassembler. You know, it's, there's not a single one that's better probably than IDA Pro. And Object Dunk as well, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't really compare to IDA. Object Dump is a really, really simple tool. Um, sometimes object dump is useful. Um, usually it's not that useful though. Um, IDA Pro is amazingly cool. You, you guys should, um, if you, if you want to know some more about, about IDA, you should definitely stick around and see Richard's talk. Um, right. Yeah, the, the thing is that you should, um, when you're um, debugging stuff, try to keep track of everything that's forked and, and spawns that have been thread, uh, threads that have been spawned, excuse me. Um, if you're using GDB, you're kind of out of luck because um, GDB will probably um, uh, crash on some uh, thread stuff. Right. Um, some more utilities. Um, for Unix, you've got S trace and L trace. S trace will give you some nice uh, information for uh, system calls that we used, and L trace um, does pretty much a similar thing, um, but for system calls. And um, on Windows, you've got some a tool that FX developed, which is Dumbug, and it can do it can do similar things. Um, the other thing for seeing more than just a crash is looking at your log files. If you see something like that in your log files, you know something's up. You know somebody tried some kind of format string bug, and apparently they succeeded, at least in triggering it. Right. Um, right. Uh, okay. Um, Extending existing fuzzers, um, that's one of the things that you should definitely um, do because the, the thing with, like, um, for example, the, um, the, HTML, uh, the Mangle Me tool from Mikhail Zalewski is that it was just scr scratching the surface. It only fuzzed a small part of HTML and it didn't even cover anything else that the browser did. So um, just if, if you just take any fuzzer that anybody ever made, just take it and look what it does and then think about things they've forgotten. If you implement those, and then just run your tool against whatever they ran it before and all the bugs they fixed, just run it again, and I can almost guarantee you that you'll find new things. Um, so um, you don't always have to start from scratch, just take other people's work, build upon it, and usually you find new, new things. Um, it, another example of this is, and this is actually a really, uh, good one, um, is the Protos, um, this, um, the uh, SIP um, fuzzing tool they had is, I mean, they've, they've spent months trying to figure out exactly where things can go wrong and they've, they've worked things out in, in, in detail. Uh, and so they've covered a lot of code paths in a lot of um, uh, devices or software that parses SIP. And so they've, they've 
probably, if, if you run something against Protoss, you can catch most of them. Um, but then, a couple of months ago, um, somebody discovered a bug in Ethereal, in SIP parsing. And this was one of the main attributes of SIP. And the, the, the actual bug in Ethereal was a, a trivial string copy where you had a stack smash and you know, buffer overflow 101. But the thing is, because the guys from Protoss had run their tool against Ethereal, and they discovered several bugs in the SIP parsing. But they had missed a specific one. So if you had taken the RFCs and look at the way people implement stuff, you would have extended um, Protoss for this thing, you would have been able to find that, that particular bug in Ethereal. Um, so e even if people have put a lot of thought into developing fuzzers, even if they spent months developing a fuzzer and putting a, you know, a, lot, of, a lot of hours into that, they, they'll still have missed some things that you might think about. Just implement it, run the tool, tools again, usually you find cool stuff, right? So, my conclusion, because I know you're all bored of me and you want to go out, um, but my conclusion is that um, fuzzing is amazingly cool. And even if, it, if I sound boring to you, you should still go out and try some fuzzers, because it's like, you have to experience, um, you just have to experience fuzzing and see what it's all about and, and get this warm, fuzzy feeling the first time you break something. Um, but so fuzzing is amazingly cool. Also, it's, if you compare um, the amount of stuff that you can find with fuzzing in a time frame and then see how, how much time it will take you to do a code audit and come to the same conclusions, um, it will probably be like a factor of 10 or something. Um, I'm not saying that you should get rid of code audits and only do um, fuzzing because there are some tools that, uh, some bugs that are uh, hard or almost in, or pretty much impossible to fuzz that you might be able to find with code audit. But if you're just out to um, find a couple of bugs, um, you know, f fuzzing will save you a lot of time. I mean, I've, I've spent the last, uh, about two years um, doing an unhealthy amount of code auditing and then I discovered fuzzing. It was like a whole new world opened uh, for me. So you can find a lot of cool things in a, a short period of time with fuzzing where it would otherwise take you um, days or weeks or months or even years um, when doing code audits. Um, and uh, fuzzing is probably the most widely used method of finding bugs these days. Um, and of course, the final conclusion, the coolest one, is that people cannot write decent parsing code. Right. And this is, right, okay, so, some advertisement. Um, there's a magazine called MISC, and there have been some of these around. I think there have been, the guys from MISC bought like 600 of them with them here. And it's a magazine about computer security. And this started off in France, and in France, I think they're up to issue 22 or 23. And since a couple of months, they've got MISC magazine here in Germany. And issue three contains an article about fuzzing, which a friend of mine made, and he's covered some of my things. Um, so um, you should definitely check out MISC, it's really cool. Although, I don't know exactly what's in it because I don't read German. <laughs> but I've talked to some of the editors and they've told me that it's re a really cool tool. <laughs> uh, magazine, yes, okay. Right, so some interesting links and this is basically where um, I'll shut up then. As, um, the first one's violating assumptions with fuzzing, which is a paper written by uh, two people at Microsoft, um, Michael Howard and another guy whose name I've forgotten. And basically this is their um, their experience that they've had throughout the, uh, a couple of years at Microsoft doing fuzzing and uh, some of the things that they've noticed uh, doing fuzzing. And there's a lot of cool stuff in there. If you, um, if you can get your hands on that paper, um, if you're at a university, you can get it for free. If you're not at a university, you have to pay IEEE 20, uh, 20 euros to get five pages of text. So, um, or if, if you're smart, you'll just bounce from some university and get it for free anyway. Um, I wasn't that smart. I, I actually paid them 20 bucks because I didn't know I could bounce off universities. Um, but, so if you're smart, you're not a university, just bounce over some and just get it for free. Um, so, but that paper's pretty neat. Um, yeah, uh, the, the next one's the, basically the um, talk that Dave Vitale gave at Black Hat in 2002 um, about Spike. You should definitely look at it. If, if you're interested in Spike, uh, that, those slides are a good starting point. Um, the next one is, is um, uh, slides from presentation that FX made, which I really, really like. And basically, um, at least from what I understood, that, that the slides or the talk was meant to show people that hacking is really hard work, although it's really fun, it's a lot of work. And uh, it, covers, um, it covers more than just fuzzing. It covers fuzzing, um, 
adding of static analysis and doing binary analysis. And then it also covers the exploit development and the making exploits reliable and then something like don't use C because C takes too long to develop stuff in. So, but that one's really cool. It gives you, it gives you a more complete picture. Um, right, the next one's a talk of um, two guys from iDefense who talked at Black Hat this year um, about file fuzzing. And that one's interesting too. Um, if you've got some time, definitely check it out. Mm. Then there's the talk from uh, Brett Mune, I think that's, it, that's his name, um, from um, at stake at the time, um, discussing Combust and how cool it really is. And if you manage to um, read that uh, PDF, you'll see um, how cool the configuration options are in Combust. And then obviously, you know, some, um, some advertisers for myself, you know, that's my website. And you can find some of my fuzzing tools there. And I've got a collection of fuzzing tools that other people made that you can find there. And I've made some slight modifications to some things that people made because um, I thought some things weren't, uh, were off or wrong or they missed some stuff. And you can find them all there. Um, if you're interested in, in fuzzing or if I've got you all hyped up for fuzzing, um, you should go there and there's some cool stuff there. Um, the, uh, yeah, the one under that is advanced of block-based fuzzing, which is where Dave Vitel, um explains to people who read it how cool block-based fuzzing is and why uh, not using block-based fuzzing sucks or why it sucks according to him. Um, the last one's uh, about the, a talk that M Matthew Franz did, uh, Black Hat, in 2003, covering this PIF tool, Protocol Independent Fuzzer. And um, basically, the, the tool's more about um, uh, figuring, uh, showing people how good or how bad um, BGP is these days in, um, in terms of security. Right. Um, that's about it. Any questions? Nope. No questions? Okay, that's good. Saves me time. Thank you.